Hello, good evening. Um, welcome to this evening. And uh, I need to thank Dimix for hosting this uh, right at the beginning uh, of my talk to you tonight. And to say, actually, my book's on sale and um, go and buy it, apparently. So 100 copies left, that's a challenge. You know, my name is Mark Cross. I'm a psychiatrist. And I'm streaming to you from my home in the Blue Mountains in a lovely um, part of the world. So hi, or oh, hello, everyone's saying hello already. So just looking at what we can do tonight, and I've done a few different webinar things over the last couple of weeks. Aren't we getting used to all of this, how, how much our life has changed? And before I start talking about my book, which is on anxiety, I have to say I've been asked on a couple of media um, stations or radio stations recently, did you choose this moment in time to release the book on anxiety or did you actually know what was going on in the time of corona? Because it is an amazing time for a book on anxiety to come out. And a bit tongue in cheek, I said to one, I said, well, us gay men have apparently been, you know, told we can cause volcanoes to erupt and earthquakes. So maybe that's in my remit, but no, I had nothing to do with it. And it's been quite a, a roller coaster journey for me in the last two months, um, and I think the book was released end of end of uh, February, beginning of March. So it's 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 certainly been linked to this time as well, where everyone's dealing with anxiety. And I'll talk to that later and answer questions. I'm asked how the book came about, and I, I'll just go into that a little bit. And 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 thank you, Tim. There's my book on the shelf. My first book was Changing Minds, which I co-authored with my friend and fellow author, Catherine Hanrahan. And I wrote that in 2016 after the ABC TV series Changing Minds demystified mental illness and um, showed it was very raw and gripping two series, one in 2014, one in 2015, where I was the lead psychiatrist and showing my work and my colleagues following an amazing group of patients in the mental health units at Liverpool and then Campbelltown. And my, my big passion in life as a psychiatrist and a sane board member is demystifying, destigmatizing, and making sure that we talk, we are able to talk about mental health. And so when the, A Changing Minds, the TV series was met with amazing acclaim worldwide. Hey, I turned 50 and I went to the Logies. We didn't get it, but we were nominated. And turning 50 as well was incredible incredible at that time. I just turned 55 on Friday. So it's been an incredible five years for me. And the book Changing Minds was a reader for the public on mental health generally. And it was it was it, it, it did well. So a couple of years after that, or in fact the year after 2017, my publisher said to me, Mark, you you're passionate about demystification, all that sort of thing. And you've got anxiety. Why don't you write a book on anxiety? I went great. It's a great privilege, I have to say, to be offered another chance to write a book. I've always wanted to be an author, and it's, it's the most amazing thing, second to being a doctor. So I said, great, okay, and then went home and had a panic attack. <laughs> That's what I do, right? So I say yes, and I, I get all excited, whatever, and then my poor husband and family have to cope with the after effects on Hi from Hobart. Hi, Tracy. I love Tassie, by the way. Uh, and I'll try not to segue too much because that's what I do. Boom, my mind goes there and I'll try and bring it back. So I pondered over this for a while and then I had everything in my head and, and get it ready. And then, of course, the dreaded marriage equality issue came about. And I had my patients, consumers of the service, my friends, my family, my colleagues all speaking to me about this. And I felt a bit flat, so I sort of put it off, put it off for a bit, and then chatted to the most amazing people for my book. So that took a long time, getting the narratives in my books. I've got 32 people, five are really close friends of mine, five are patients, people I treat, and about 21 are sane peer ambassadors. These are people with lived experience, complex mental health issues who talk openly about their anxiety, and that's what makes the book amazing. I can talk a, bit, a little bit about that later. So, I, <clears throat> and something's just come up, Melissa, in the Changing Mind series, you showed no hint of your own anxieties. Oh man, we can talk about that, Melissa. I have to say, 
I perform well. And, and so just to touch on that, there are a couple of forms of anxiety. And I've got the one that it's a deer in headlights. So I always look really calm. Meanwhile, inside, I'm like jelly. And my mind's going racing or going somewhere else. And my, my eyes are veering somewhere else. And in my final exam at medical school, and I mentioned this in the book, which was the last ever clinical exam before it was determined I was going to be a doctor. It was a pediatrics exam. And pediatricians are generally nice people, right? So I'm sitting there, and the one examiner, I remember this distinctly, leaned forward and said, it looks like you'd rather be at the beach. Are we boring you? Which is never really great in an exam to hear, right? And then, of course, I started getting more and more anxious and looked the traumatized student part, and I managed to pass. I'll never forget that as long as I live. So my poor husband gets the flakiness after I perform, like even tonight, I was running around going, is the sound going to be okay? I don't know. Oh, my God. Oh, oh, this, this, oh, I mean, really, it's, 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 it's quite incredible. Then I sit down, and he looks at me like, who the hell are you? You just switched completely. And that's something that uh, I, write, I, read, um, I write about. So the book came along. It took me a while. Oh, my God, it took me a while to finally get there. And towards the end of last year, while I was away from my clinical you know, my day job, essentially, which is quite busy. I finished the book with my publisher's help, Jude. She's, she was magnificent. And it came out January, I was finished, and it came out literally at the end of February, just as Corona was starting. So what I'll do now, and um, I hope that was uh, enough where you can ask some questions later, but I'm going to read my introduction. And then I'm going to answer questions. There have been quite a lot already. So my, my ADD mind is already looking at the sign. Um, and Donna makes a really interesting point. Most can perform without any signs of anxiety. I certainly do. And it is difficult. And I'll just speak to that point. Because in mental health surveys, you see, I told you I get segued, right? In mental health surveys, and in Australia, we had one in 2011, and that's where a lot of people use incident of 14%. So in, in the last 12 months in that survey, if you had symptoms of anxiety for the sort of five main ones, OCD, PTSD, generalized anxiety disorder, agoraphobia and panic disorder, and social anxiety, so that's six. Anyway, 14%. Um, and so when you're looking at the incidence of anxiety generally, one in five Americans, for instance, identify as having anxiety. But the difficulty with people to acknowledge or understand what anxiety is, is that we all get anxiety, right? So what do you mean it's an anxiety disorder? And what people don't understand, we don't have anxiety, <clears throat> excuse me, is that you have these fight or flight symptoms so heart racing, chest tightening, sweaty, shaking, sphincters clenching, eyes dilating, as you would if you had a pack of wolves running towards you and then you can jump over the wall. In anxiety, you get that when you're just sitting, sipping a glass of lemonade and it just hits you, bam. That's the difference. There's nothing to be anxious for. And so people have that issue with feeling anxious before an exam or performing for something. That's what people suffer with when they have anxiety. Okay. You see, I'm, I'm now reading the, the signs. Okay. Thank you, Sue. She says, I look perfectly calm and collected. Um, yeah, I won't, I won't put a camera in my head right now. <laughs> okay. So let me read my introduction, and then I'll come back to talking to you. Mark Cross is nervous. That was the opening sentence in an article in the Sydney Morning Herald about an ABC TV documentary series called Changing Minds that I featured in. And it pretty much sums it up, because I suffer from anxiety. Oh, and I'm a shrink. For me, anxiety is the red-eyed yeti sitting on the edge of my bed or hovering above me as I, panic-stricken, shift from sleep to full wakefulness in the dead of night, a brute whose burning gaze bores into my inner being. I feel it during bad times, waiting to burst through like a beast from my horror novella. At other times, it seems less angry, appearing to want to hold me and be understood. I've experienced these night terrors since the age of four, 
and during stressful times they become more frequent. I was an anxious child. My mother has anxiety. Her mother was a medication for anxiety. My anxiety was compounded by early self-awareness that I was different. As much as I fought it and tried to be normal, I finally acknowledged to myself in my early teens that I was gay. Not that I came out then, coming out to myself was hard enough. I waited another decade before I confirmed it to my family and friends. Homosexuality at the time was illegal and considered a perversion. Further, homosexuality was categorized as a mental illness. So when I was training as a doctor, I had to hide this part of me, my identity. This took its toll on my health and certainly helped cause my neuroses to worsen. There was no one to talk to, no one offering advice. It has taken me a very long time to adjust to this lack of support when I was younger. In fact, I've identified it as a major perpetuating factor in my anxiety until fairly recently. Over the years, I've experienced moments of migraine-like headaches with nausea, shallow breathing, heartburn, even vomiting. At times, I become silent in company. My facial expressions become restricted and I gaze away as if preoccupied, holding my breath without realizing. Often, I'll need to excuse myself and lie down. My Yeti is always present. I have the gene for narcolepsy and I've undergone sleep studies and have been prescribed medication to keep awake. But they make me agitated and unable to sleep. In my family, there's also a history of bipolar affective disorder. And even when I'm not frozen with anxiety, there can be a manic, often frenetic quality to my mood. My foot often finds refuge in my mouth. And if I inadvertently blurt out something unfortunate, the cycle of nocturnal self-doubting self-recriminating, self-deprecating ruminations make short work of my sleep. I know that the fearful negative thoughts that circle my consciousness like buzzards at a, at a feeding frenzy are just that, my own thoughts. On a functional level, I acknowledge their ridiculous nonsense not to be entertained, entertained by my rational mind. But this just further erodes my positive sense of self. Yes, I know all that, but still can't make it stop, despite reassurance from loved ones and the benefit of hindsight from past experiences of similar neurotic frenzies. I've been in therapy for most of the past decade, but not as frequently as I should be, and nod to my patient, gentle therapist, for not berating me as much as she could have. I'm a work in progress, and I know I'm in for the long haul, learning to better deal with everything. Meanwhile, I'm living a full life, albeit one with a certain messiness at times. I'm still learning how to manage my anxiety. There have been improvements and I feel generally more in control, but I'd never say that I've overcome my lifelong condition. Of course, I'm not alone. In fact, we live in an age of anxiety, work anxiety, health anxiety, especially now with coronavirus, anxiety about terrorism. There's even a Trump anxiety disorder. Perhaps there's a corresponding Kim Jong-un depressive disorder. It was more than 70 years ago that W.H. Auden wrote his Pulitzer Prize winning poem, The Age of Anxiety, about the horrors of war and alienation in our modern world. Perhaps anxiety has always existed in the human experience, but Auden's poem suggests that the incidents and the way we experience it has evolved since the Industrial Revolution. That evolution has continued, perhaps even gathered pace. It seems we've become increasingly intolerant of discomfort and unease, which, coupled with our frenetic efforts to be successful, has made us increasingly anxious. Busyness, a fear of not contributing to society, of being judged and being found not worthy, is part of 21st century life. And then there's our inability to reflect on our mortality, which paradoxically doesn't engender inner calm or help us grow old gracefully. Instead, we reach for anti-aging creams and curate idealized social media representations of ourselves. No wonder so many of us suffer from anxiety. As it turns out, globally, anxiety disorders are in the top six leading causes of what is known as the burden of disease. The burden of disease is a measure of the impact of a disease, 
of the years of healthy life lost or diminished in quality as a result of living with a disability that affects all aspects of your existence. Mental and substance use disorders are the leading cause of non-fatal disability in the world. In Australia, anxiety is extremely common, with at least 11% or 2.6 million people reporting anxiety-related conditions in 2014 to 2015, and 5.1% of Australians reporting an anxiety-related condition and a mood affective disorder. In the USA, the figure is 18%. Nearly one-fifth of Americans identify as anxious. This picture is confronting. In the West, stress is frequently cited as a leading cause of employment-related hardship in medical certificates, and anxiety is now one of the primary causes of mental health-related absences from work. And yet, there's still stigma, prejudice and discrimination leading to self-loathing. I recently gave a speech where I mentioned my anxiety and the self-stigma I still carry. A professor of psychiatry told me afterwards that he considered me brave for so doing. But if we can't accept illness in ourselves and understand that it's not weakness, how do we expect others to stop the name-calling and bullying? Which is why I've chosen to acknowledge my own demon, the red-eyed yeti of my subconscious. I can't ask others, doctors among them, to be open about their lived experience of anxiety if I can't do so myself. So I'm adding my voice, not only as a psychiatrist, but also as a person who has to deal with anxiety in some form or other every day. It strikes me that people suffering mental health issues may be interested to hear from someone trained to treat them who also suffers from the same condition. So when the idea for this book was muted, I was excited. During the first conversation with my publisher, I was already working out the layout in my head and making a list of people I'd interview. That was before my anxiety kicked in. Soon I was worrying that I wasn't up to the task and that if I wrote a book about anxiety and my own neurotic issues, not only would I be shunned by other health professionals, but my patients wouldn't want to take advice from me anymore. Of course, there's an abundance of evidence to the contrary. Over the years, I've talked about my anxiety in radio and TV interviews, and my patients accept and like the fact that I share my neuroses with them. One of my patients says that what he likes about me is my no-nonsense open approach, that I walk the walk, not just talk the talk. Inadvertently, he's reiterated why I'm so qualified to write on this subject and why I should press on with this book. It helps me to recall his words when I think self-stigmatizing thoughts. But, as I often say to my patients, having to deal with anxiety and other mental health issues isn't great, but it does make you a better person, more open to understanding what other people go through, and more tolerant, generally. This is what I believe to be the case. My anxiety and awkward sense of adolescent difference, more about that later, has helped me be a more understanding and compassionate psychiatrist. Nevertheless, it's risky and unconventional for a doctor to write a book detailing personal flaws. I was trained to be someone of moral character who's aware of their status and who should keep personal issues compartmentalized. But this medical ideal doesn't sit well with my personable, compassionate approach to patients, colleagues, and training doctors. We doctors are expected to be reflective of our practice and ourselves. We're directed to do so as part of our ongoing continuing professional development. And the truth is, we suffer from mental health issues. In fact, a 2013 Beyond Blue survey showed that medical doctors have higher, higher rates of psychological distress and attempted suicide compared to both the Australian population and other Australian professionals. <clears throat> Stigmatizing attitudes regarding the competence of doctors with mental health conditions and therefore their opportunities for career progression persist in the medical community, with 40% of doctors feeling that medical professionals with a history of mental health disorders are perceived as less competent than their peers. Indigenous doctors and students appear to be especially vulnerable to poor mental health. Almost all doctors felt that doctors need to present a healthy image. Of those doctors surveyed by Beyond Blue, 10% had anxiety. So I lie in bed, wide awake, 
worrying about my peers' judgment and critics' assessment that I am no longer worthy of my club membership. My constant doubts and ever-circling ruminations are particularly finely honed when it comes to my practice of medicine. Coming out with what is essentially a mental illness still sometimes feels like an admission of weakness, an acknowledgement of a condition that people may perceive will impede or distract me from doing my job safely or well. I wish it didn't feel that way. I strive to break down, I strive to break down barriers, to destigmatize as well as humanize those with mental health issues. I'm writing this book to demonstrate that anyone, no matter their station in life or job description, can feel it's okay to come out as experiencing mental health issues. Even, in this instance, a medical doctor who specializes in treating those with mental health conditions. You can live a productive life, a big life, with anxiety, even if you never quite nail the management of it completely. People can improve to the point where their anxiety symptoms are negligible or recover from an episode of anxiety, depending on the cause. I encourage my patients and friends to unthink the binary notion of strong versus weak, especially when it comes to mental health symptoms. A person with anxiety is just that, a person with symptoms that can be managed and treated. You're not the illness, you're a person with a treatable condition. Understanding and compassion from friends and relatives also goes a long way in helping someone with anxiety symptoms to settle, as well as reducing stigma and discrimination. A friendly acknowledgement from a loved one that you're not going crazy, a hug, understanding that symptoms are just that, not the whole person, all helps. As I write, or should I say read these words, my respiration is increasing, I have palpitations, my breathing is shallower. This conditioned response is so strong in me, even now when being more open and less fearful is how I want to be. I'm in my 50s, just turned 55. There have to be benefits of experience and age. There are. In 2017, I was interviewed by my SANE director, colleague and friend, Osher Gunsberg, for his podcast series, ostensibly about Schizophrenia Week. He opened with a question about growing up gay in South Africa. It ended up being a delightful, fun interview. On reflection, it showed me how far I've come in terms of being able to talk about secrets and vulnerabilities. Four years prior, I would have struggled to answer without feeling panic and shame. So, without further ado, I present, with much anxiety, my book on anxiety. In it, I'll explore the very nature of anxiety, as well as causes, treatments, therapies, and lifestyle changes that can help, anxiety at work, and very importantly, how to navigate the health systems. Each chapter would, will touch on my own experiences, personal and clinical, as well as the stories of real people. Their empowering stories serve to distract me from my neurotic ruminations, enabling me to say, read on, there's a worthwhile journey ahead. Thanks for listening, that was my introduction. Oh. I would feel, so Deirdre says, I would feel more comfortable consulting a practitioner who has experienced a condition that I am experiencing. It gives insight into the experience. Thank you, Deirdre, and that's a positive reinforcement of what I believe. And of course, with age comes wisdom and various else as well. I've been a doctor over three continents over 30 years. And in everywhere, every system I worked in, it's the same. People want compassion, they deserve kindness, and they deserve somebody who's going to hear and listen to their narrative, not just give them a diagnosis and a pill. Okay. So thank you, Andrea says, fabulous introduction. It uh, took me a while to read that, I have to say. Not now, but uh, write it, should I say. Okay. So who wants to throw some questions at me? Um, let me look, let me scroll down. Okay. So Georgia. Thanks for your time tonight. Hey, you know, the, the nice thing, I'll say it quickly before I answer your question, Georgia. Hello, wherever you, wherever you are. This is a wonderful way to connect and people are asking me during this time of corona with increased anxiety, what we can do. And uh, actually, I should read your question before I go into something else. Wondering what everyday strategies we can put into place to help us feel better during isolation. Well, there you go, it was meant to be. 
excuse me, it is vitally important to keep to a routine and structure. But I want to tell you that this thing, right? And I've said to a couple of my patients, and we've laughed on the phone about this. Number one, I'm an extrovert and introvert, but I'm an, I'm an introvert. I quite like being at home. And so at the beginning of all this, we were joking and going, okay, we don't like being told we have to stay at home, but hey, this is quite nice being at home. I don't have to worry too much. And I don't miss driving. It's actually quite nice not driving everywhere. But now people are really, and, and people in the last couple of months have found it harder. This is not a rationale to become a better you. I mean, that's nice if you can learn things. And I'm trying to be a better person by looking at my relationships. And, you know, joking aside, my husband and I have got on much better during this time, with a few exceptions, of course, because I'm no longer running around trying to compensate and do things all the time without saying no. We've looked at what's important, and I think that's that's part of what I'm going to say. But the structure is vital. Got to get out of bed. Got to do your thing. Stretching. We're walking. And I, you know, I referenced my age earlier. I've not seen so many people walk their dogs and kids since the 1970s, and I remember I was there. So it's incredible. So we've got to hold on to our communities, and this is a community. We we're talking to each other from all over Australia. And Australia, when we get this right, this sense of mateship and connection is amazing. Yes, of course, there's domestic violence issues, there's mental health issues. Um, some, are, some of us are more equally in this than others. I've got a beautiful house and a beautiful space. And so I've got to be mindful of that. But reach out. We go for walks. We tap on our elderly neighbors' doors. We check that they're OK. There's a greater sense of community with neighbors, with friends, with my same um, and, board members and staff members. I'm a member of the Rainbow Families community, so that's a LGBTQIP um, parenting and child network. Uh, my work, my family abroad, friends abroad, Zoom, all these things, reach out, talk to someone every day. And it doesn't have to be someone you know, and it doesn't have to be someone in your own home. If you're living alone, you can um, call Lifeline, San Australia, Beyond Blue, San Australia has online forums 24-7, moderated. So they're, they're, they're all those things. Okay, I'll, I'll take another question. So, hey, Tom. Um, it's a pleasure sharing my story, thanks. Was it difficult writing such a personal book? Well, I think part of, partly I answered that a bit in the introduction because it was incredible. You, you get given these opportunities in life and you have to grab them, right? And it's amazing. And then, and this is what I often do, I say, yes, and it's great. And I'm an, I'm an action man. And then I sit down and then my family goes, did you think this through? <laughs> and then I sat and I thought it through. And I thought, okay, what am I going to do about my own stuff? Because I, as I said earlier, I exhort people to be open. And if we can't be open as doctors and people, you know, such as myself, who treat others, then who can be? I have to lead by example. And, you know, I, I think that's a very critical um, part of my answer. And, yes, it is incredibly hard because, you know, there's a privacy. We have, a pri we have private lives. And uh, as I said earlier, we were trained, and I was trained very specifically as a doctor not to share myself. Part of that, I've been analysing that over the last couple of years, is a little bit of homophobia in, in that. Because you go see a therapist or a doctor, you know, they're wearing a wedding ring, the pictures of their families on their desk and whatever, and there's this heteronormative assumption that, you know, they, they, they're straight or, you know, you know a bit about them. I didn't actually, I wasn't open about my sexuality at work. To my colleagues, yes, and whatever. It's been a process throughout my life. But if a patient asked me directly, I always said yes. And it was always just manic women. I love manic women. We know, they, they remember everything. They're very bright. And they always ask direct questions. And then that was great. And actually being um, open about myself has helped me with traumatized people, especially complex trauma with uh, my women patients. But it has been, it, it was hard. And in fact, I went away uh, in February when the book was released. I just, I, my heart is in my chest. And when you think you're putting yourself out there, you're raising your head above the parapet. And as I said, and that, I gave that speech and I was told I was brave for doing so, which just seems to come naturally 
to me. So, yes. Um, so, Barbara, hi, Barbara. Do men experience or deal with anxiety differently to women? And is there a difference between older generation men and younger men? And thanks for being open as a practitioner. Yes, well, there, you know, there are gender differences generally in types of anxiety disorders. And it's interesting. So PTSD, for instance, and generalized anxiety disorder are the most common types of anxiety disorder. And both are more common in women. And you'd think that PTSD, because that's always linked to war and trauma and violence, would be more common in men. And, of course, men do suffer badly with it, especially war vets as well as female war vets. But you don't actually have to experience trauma, and that's that shifted quite a bit since my medical school training. You can live, you can, you can vicariously experience trauma, and even hearing about horrible trauma is enough to actually cause symptoms later on. Now, older men, and, and that's part of our smile, because hey, I'm, I'm, I can get a cruise a discount now at the age of 55, so I'm getting there. We were trained and taught, but also as young men, masculinity was in South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, it's all very similar in the 70s and 80s, even now, with masculinity being absolutely pushed into us. And my report cards from the 1970s, and just shows you how much teaching has changed. My one report card when I was in primary school read, if Mark's jaws were made of finishing glass, they would have cracked a long time ago. Another one said, Mark was inoculated with a gramophone needle. Another one, Mark needs to spend less time with girls. He needs to toughen up. I remember baking and cooking, the signs were there when I was much younger. My husband wonders where that skill has gone because I don't like doing that now. Maybe it was sort of pushed out of me. But in late primary school, I handed in a recipe for a cake to the teacher. He marked me down because boys don't bake. So all these constant affirmations when you're younger, and I talk about Jimmy Barnes in the book, that wonderful man, you know, working class man, and he talks in his book about Australia when he was growing up, and he's a bit older than me, so 70s and 80s, with alcoholism, domestic violence, promiscuity, neglect, so much trauma. And a friend of mine is a psychiatrist in London and she deals with executives. She said to me, she's never been to Australia. I'm holding that against her. Hey. She said uh, over a glass of wine one day, she said, Mark, I don't want to be funny, but I see all these really um, big executive men from Australia in their 40s, 50s, early 60s. And all of them have such trauma and they don't even no, they don't haven't even unpacked it. They just take it as red in a way. And so that sort of generational thing and definitely a gender thing about being open and talking and why do you think 75% of suicides are men still? It's a dreadful thing and it's something we really need to get right or improve in our society. So, hey, Sue, um, what are the most common symptoms of anxiety? How can you recognize it in yourself or your loved ones? Okay, so it's a very interesting question, or they all are. The most common symptoms of anxiety, so there are two major forms of symptoms, right? So you get the intellectual, or the thinking, the cognition, so those are thoughts, horrible, fearful ruminations of those thoughts that circle your brain and won't go away about the future. And we talk about anxiety living in the future. And that's why we'll talk later about a little bit maybe about mindfulness, staying in the present is what we need to do. Depression sort of sinking in that we're more in the past. And so the other form is of course the physical manifestations and the main systems in the body linked to anxiety, the heart, the gut and the skin. Um, because you get headaches and neurological stuff. And the heart races, and as I mentioned earlier, that fight and flight scenario. And that is an evolutionary process. That's so we can survive, right? So we're strolling along and the saber-toothed tiger comes towards us. We don't just go, hey, nice pussy. Uh, you know, we run. And the heart pounds, blood goes to our extremities. You know, that's uh, your, as I said earlier, pupils delight and you can 
jog a mile quickly. That's what happens when you get anxiety. And a lot of people, including two of my friends who write in the book, go to the emergency department because they think they're having a heart attack. And it's very, it's very similar and it's horrible. And you have to get it checked out. You can't just say, oh, you're having an anxiety attack if you've never had it before. But if it's linked to something that just stressed you out and you realize that there are other issues as well in your chest tightening, that's a clue. As I said earlier as well, when people remark on me looking so calm, and meanwhile, if you listen to my breathing or you see my eyes shifting or, you know, I blurb something out or I spoonerize, which is swapping the first letter of two words by mistake, and these are and stutter and I, I stammer a bit sometimes. And so when you're looking at other people, it can sometimes not be so obvious, especially in people who've been traumatized. And that is often a problem because their lack of response or withdrawing into themselves is taken as consent by those doing further harm to them. And that deer in their headlights, it sort of leaves you sweaty and horrible, but on the inside, but not screaming and shaking and, and palpitating. And severe anxiety can lead to what we call depersonalization or derealization, where you feel disconnected from your environment, like you're looking at it through fog or a plate glass a window. And then people just see you as withdrawing and being bored or something. And then they go, oh, are we boring you? Which further makes the person anxious. And so it's clearer when people are shaking and hyperventilating because that's a more common form. And then you can recognize that in others. And I won't go into what you do now. Maybe we'll talk about that later. <clears throat> Excuse me. Wow, okay. Hi, Alana. <clears throat> so, my generalized anxiety disorder seemed to be incredibly negatively affected by lack of sleep and routine last year. What are your thoughts on how sleep and routine can affect anxiety? Well, you've hit the nail on the head there. And I do write a book in the chapter, uh, get, balancing your yin, yin and yang, I call it. Um, and that's lifestyle. So, just quickly, when I'm formulating a management plan, with the people that I'm seeing, there's a four-prong approach. So that's biopsychosocial lifestyle. Bio is the medical stuff that I do, doctory bits, medication, your genetic vulnerability, what you know makes you vulnerable to developing anxiety. Then psychological, how do we cope with ourselves and our interaction with the world around us? And social, drugs and alcohol there, you know, if you've got a good place to live or not, those things add anxiety. Then the third, the fourth, sort of the fourth big arm of this treatment management, I call it my holy trinity, Elena, and that's diet, sleep, and exercise. And yes, I say to my patients, I'm giving you the, you know, I'm giving you the purest version here, and then I'm giving you the practical version here of what's going to be like for you. So I say all these things, and then... I'm lying in bed on my phone. My husband's going, follow your own advice. Put your phone down. So sleep is absolutely pivotal to any mood, anything actually. You have to get the routine right. Sleep is our body rebooting. That's why it's called circadian rhythms. Hormones, everything gets sort of flushed out and through the system in that period of sleep. And it's incredibly important to stick to that and stick to a good routine. And it's a major cause and ongoing perpetuating factor of anxiety. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, I shook up like this. <coughs> okay, Siobhan, I hope I've got that spelling right. I'm having Irish blood. Is it appropriate to allow you, is it appropriate to show your anxiety to your children? Or do they need to see and feel that their parents are in control? And know what's going on. Okay, my children, Siobhan, know exactly how to handle me and I do and I get quite cranky at times when when I get anxious it's horrible because my mind and I hate myself when I'm like this so it just makes me more angry at myself and I can be a cantankerous old bee. Okay, so and yeah sometimes I am so you know I know when I need to go to my room or whatever. Being open with your children is never an issue. 
being horrible to your children and being a narcissist and, a, and a, somebody who calls them names is not something that's good for children. But, you know, dealing with children with anxiety and being open doesn't increase their anxiety. That means that you're being open and honest and you have a loving relationship with your kids and that's the most important. And it's, it's funny you mentioned that because I got my book here and my son, uh, so I've got two kids, two sons, and hey, I'll put it out there. We've got four, four parents, so it's wonderful, you know, have them part-time and uh, I don't have to. So yesterday I did two webinars uh, with my kids and I was in the room and I was, the wife, I wasn't working and I thought, my God, people have to do this every day. I take my hats off to you. So my son has gone in, my nine-year-old has now gone into this frenzy of sticky labeling something. He found this, this machine and I was reading this on a webinar the other day and he put his name <laughs> down over mine and I was reading this and everyone saw Dr. Clem Cross so there was a question about that so you know what being open with my patients and being open with my kids means they know who I am as long as I also show yes that there is an element of control and I'm working on things and I apologize for when I get a bit ratty and, and, that's, and that works and also it's great hugging So, hey, Jen Jen, do you have any advice for how to help someone having a panic attack or a similar episode? Yes, so it's very hard. And the one thing I will say when people ask me, what do you do when somebody has anxiety? What you don't do is go, hey, chill. Nobody with anxiety wants to hear that. Of course, we know that we are supposed to be doing that. And just by you adding that makes us worse. The best thing, the best advice I think I can offer in a situation like that is to go to the person, hold their hand, ask them if they want some water, look at them in the eyes and go, hey, I can see you having difficulty with breathing. Acknowledge what they're going through. I can see you having difficulty with breathing. Let's try to breathe together. Offer practical advice. And it comes down to that mindfulness. What mindfulness is, is really being in the present, in the moment, and helping them just tether there rather than all over the place in the future, as I said earlier. Offer them help, ask them if they need you to call someone, and if they do need to go to hospital, because some people do, say, I will wait while they, with you till the ambulance gets here, and if you need me to, I'll come through to hospital. Nobody wants to sit in the emergency department waiting room, I have to say this, but that's the best thing and the most loving thing you can do to someone who needs uh, extra help and, and needs to go to hospital. They don't want to do it alone. So, hey, Andrea. Does anxiety present differently in people who have autistic spectrum disorder? And does it make it more difficult to treat or manage? Yes, yeah, so I, don't, I don't write a lot about um, autistic spectrum or, in fact, ADHD or ADD in the book. I mention them. You know, you only got so much space in a book, I suppose. Um, but it's incredibly um, linked. So anxiety disorders, ADD, and autistic spectrum disorders are linked. And often in children, their first presentation will be an anxious type 1 before the diagnosis is made. The issue with autism, of course, it depends how severe the autistic spectrum uh, disorder is is they have difficulty you know, reading emotion, interacting on an emotional level, and understanding and empathizing. And so you've got to try in when you're talking to them, and children generally, make it as simple as possible and about them. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and certainly if they, if they don't like being tactile, they have to look at other ways of helping them contain things for themselves because it doesn't matter how they present their anxiety, whether they're flapping or rhythmically rocking or whatever, you have to try, and similar to the question earlier, try and get them out of that anxious moment. And usually connection with that person is, is useful. So it does make it a little bit more difficult on that, on that level. And uh, yeah, sure, thanking me, Barbara, for an earlier question. Cheers. Okay, apparently it's the last question. Um, thanks for listening. I tend to rattle on a bit. Uh, 
and Hannah. It's always these last questions are always the most pertinent ones, right? So, what mechanism do you personally use to cope with your anxiety? You know, and I try and do this, but I, I, as I said earlier, I do try and look at my sleep, and I need my husband helps me with this. So I try not to eat three to four hours before I go to bed, I, but the Cadbury chocolate doesn't help. I try and stay off my devices at least an hour before bed. But we mentioned that earlier. Um, husband's uh, rolling his eyes here, but I do try this. And I know, and you know, I love watching Game of Thrones and Vikings, right? That doesn't help my sleep. So I know when I don't watch TV, when I eat earlier, and I don't go on my devices, I sleep better. And then I feel better the next day because then I'm waking up at a reasonable time because time management has never been my friend. I'm useless at time management. I get distracted like you wouldn't believe. And then I end up rushing out of the house late. That's not a good way to start your day. So getting up on time and now walking. And we're actually enjoying walking in the morning. And that's really given me a, an equanimity to start my day. And that, I think, is, a, is the nicest thing. And I'm trying to do yoga. I said for 50 years, please don't talk to me about yoga. Yoga, exercise really helps, and stretching. So I start that every day. And, you know, the days I don't do it, I feel worse. Oh, thanks, Siobhan, and keep being open. Thank you so much. And thanks so much for the lovely, lovely questions. And, of course, I suppose I could say I've answered them all in my book. <laughs> So thank you, thank you all, uh, and please call me Mark. And you know, uh, I must say just before we go, uh, Australia is a lucky country in many ways, and I must say we've done incredibly well, much better than I'd hoped for in this time of coronavirus. And so I leave you with that heartfelt message, and I want to I leave you with one thing. I love my female philosopher Cinderella. We took we didn't actually touch on resilience. This is a woman who is amazing with resilience right she epitomizes resilience and if you've not seen the 2015 version with our very own kate lanchette as a wicked stepmother in haute couture please it's amazing but i leave you with this and and i really mean it compassion and 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 kindness is is something i really truly believe in have courage and be kind and that's from cinderella and i think we need to take that on board and be kind to yourself Thanks. Thanks very much for listening, everyone. Have a lovely night.